Um, as a, a recently graduated cohort for the most part, we don't have a lot to give back um, to demonstrate our thanks, but we would like to um, sing a, a waiata for you all. Um, so I'd like to invite um, those from the, the ministry, my colleagues, to come forward. And also, um, the, the words are going to be on the screen, so if you'd like to, I'd also like to invite everybody else to, to stand if, you, if you'd like and um, join us in, in singing if you want to. Um, I'd also like to caveat that um, this was not uh, reasonably impromptu, so we don't have a backing track. So we're going to trust in our um, a cappella skills. Um, luckily, this isn't uh, New Zealand's Got Talent, but um, I think we'll be pretty good anyway. to say good morning or good afternoon because we are bang on the dot of noon and it's my pleasure to step in and chair this panel on sustainability. Um, Rachel Wolfgram, my colleague, unfortunately is unable to make it so you've got me, Natasha Hamilton Hart, instead. Um, interestingly enough, Rachel and I both sometimes teach in the sustainability area so I'm actually really delighted to be um, in the company of people who are going to address the issue of sustainability and the green economy as it relates to trade. I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order in which they will speak. Um, so let me start with Phil Holding, who is Director International Policy in the Ministry of Primary Industries. Um, and his background, as well as being obviously very um, having, where, from where he is now, his background includes time in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and with the Meat Industry Association. Our second speaker will be Mark Sinclair, who is a career diplomat with several offshore postings and particularly relevant to the trade issue, has um, spent time in Geneva as director of with the WT, New Zealand's WTO mission and has also served as director of MFAT's trade negotiations division and has been served as climate change ambassador. Uh, so again, very relevant for this panel. 
Our third speaker will be Glynis Miller, who is Trade Commissioner at Pacific Trade Invest New Zealand. And Glynis brings a wealth of experience in Pacific Island trade and economic development related issues. And she has been most recently at the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. Last but by no means least, Malcolm Johns is the incoming Chief Executive of Genesis Energy, having recently completed nine years as Chief Executive of Christchurch Airport and serving as New Zealand Delegate at the APEC Business Council and on its Working Group for Climate Leadership for Business. So again, a very relevant and um, topical perspective from business and the challenges around sustainability. Uh, so each speaker will um, speak for about 12 minutes and we should have good time for some questions and answers at the end. Please, um, Phil, do you take? Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm just going to start my, uh, my stopwatch here. Um, when I was serving with uh, MFAT in Washington, there was an industry representative who used the phrase, I've never met a microphone I haven't fallen in love with. Um, and that's a risk, as anyone from my team who's here will tell you. Um, but I did want to thank Jennifer and the Public Policy Institute um, for having this, um, for running this course again. I think it's a really important um, fixture now in the, in the calendar. And um, I've had a couple of kind of weird memory shocks today. Uh, one, as a graduate of this institution, I'm walking through orientation this morning, uh, and then thinking to all you MFAT graduates, um, back to Otago Foreign Policy School, if I'm allowed to say that here, um, and just hoping in the interest of esprit de corps that you're feeling as bad as I did for most of that, um, during the days anyway. Um, so um, just to explain my role, um, I'm the Director of International Policy at MPI. Uh, we cover um, really, it's, it's, it's easy to sort of say what we don't cover. What we don't cover is the technical conditions of uh, is this piece of meat safe to eat or not? And here's a certificate that proves it. But we do trade policy, uh, environment policy, oceans, and, and everything else that might pertain to the primary sectors and trade. Um, so with that, uh, I want to start with two I hope possibly obvious points. Um, the first one is that trade in the broader sense um, and environmental issues are increasingly coming together. I think that's well recognised, pretty obvious. Um, that's both in the sense of formal trade negotiations and commercial realities. Um, although I would say it's important to recognise that's not consistent and it's not the case in all jurisdictions and all markets. So it's a pretty patchy space, but it is getting bigger and more important. The second point I wanted to make is that the solution to the challenges that we face as New Zealand and primary sector in particular, um, they may not always be in trade agreements. Um, although, um, just in the interests of reassuring you of your future job security, uh, there is a need for more and more international collaboration and negotiations. Um, but, you know, there was a bit of an interesting discussion in the previous panel about what a trade agreement is or can be, uh, and I think that question is very live and, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Um, so the, the blurb for the session referred to a number of agreements. Uh, I'm not going to go straight into those. I wanted to start from our objectives. Um, if you look at Fit for a Better World, which was a, a roadmap introduced in 2020, launched by the former Prime Minister, it has three headline objectives, uh, to return $10 billion more value to New Zealand from the primary sector, to reduce emissions by 24 to 47% in line with the Zero Carbon Act, uh, and improve our water, and to have 10,000 more jobs in the primary sector. So um, you can match those to those other objectives, that high level theme of productive, sustainable and inclusive. So our international role as MPI within that is really in those first two, um, productive and sustainable. And I like to think of our directorate's role as being about maximising our sector's competitiveness. And I think that's a, a, intended to be a relatively nuanced term. It's not about maximising production uh, and exports. And previously, um, the Ministry's public strategy was export double. Um, we're not in that space. Uh, we're about maximising the value returned within, a tighter and, within tighter environmental limits and higher expectations of the primary sector. So how are, we, how are we going to do that? How do we make or try to make our primary sectors more competitive? One is that trade policy is still critical. Tariffs are still a problem. Non-tariff barriers are a multi-billion dollar problem and enduring one. 
Um, so we're, we're going to be heavily involved in trade policy. But we also have a strong approach to advocate for more ambition in reducing emissions from global food production. Uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in that space, and I'll come back to that. Um, but mostly for us, this is about a level playing field. You heard that from Simon Tucker. Uh, and there are lots of issues that I'm going to dive into uh, that, that sort of prevent us from getting there. And, and, you know, we start in the agriculture sector in a pretty distorted space already, uh, as Simon alluded to, especially in certain products. So um, I want to dive into some examples here. So there, uh, there are risks and opportunities for New Zealand in this space. So um, really, let me um, let's start from a, a kind of cliche in the agriculture space. Every country has a version of the phrase, our farmers are already the best in the world. Um, and we're not immune to that ourselves, um, depending on who, you, who you're asking. But what's happening is every country who produces food is under more pressure to perform better environmentally. Lots of countries are changing their regulations and legislation, and they're coming under a lot of pressure, governments, to apply those same standards to imports from other countries. So what we're worried about is these unilateral decisions that are made that suit a particular context, a particular production system, but won't suit trade or it won't suit those of us who produce in other systems. So I want to talk a little bit about the European Union in this space. So um, before I say anything, let me just say that our relationship with the European Union is actually really strong and really important in the climate space in particular, where we're all trying to solve this big problem of methane emissions from livestock in particular. So I want this to be taken in the right spirit. So under the Green Deal, there's a farm to fork program that uh, has a whole bunch of, um, of domestic change in the European Union, and now um, we're seeing a broad set of regulations that will apply to imports too, uh, under the rubric of mirror clauses. As we said to the European Union, there's a bit of a problem with the metaphor in that um, the thing with the mirror is that both sides are identical, uh, and we're not identical, we have a different, pro a different production system, so we have to make sure we can work together. Um, the problem, I want to you know, dive down one level now beneath that just to pick up one of those things. So the European Union has a deforestation or anti-deforestation regulation. Um, what it basically says is uh, for a few commodities, I'll name a few, I won't have the quite full list, beef, soy, coffee, cocoa, there's a couple of others. You can't trade into the European Union if the land you're growing that commodity on has been deforested since 2020. And you go, okay, policy objective, we get it. Um, we're seeing a lot of global deforestation. Uh, it's a big problem for a whole bunch of reasons. So, but what's the problem in that for New Zealand? In New Zealand, we have flexible land use. It's deliberate. It's really important. So farmers can choose, uh, farmers and others can choose to cut down trees and grow beef and land. If they do that, they pay a carbon cost uh, and other costs associated with that. Um, and it, but it, that flexibility, I come back to the word competitiveness, it's critical to New Zealand that you're, allow, you're actually allowed to do that. Um, the other thing we've said to the European Union is regardless of what happens at a kind of paddock by paddock level, um, we're going to have more trees in the coming years and our climate settings take us in that direction. What they're asking exporters to the European Union to do is provide geolocation data for each paddock that you've grown your, um, your beef in, right? So think about the cost of that for an exporter out of New Zealand. You'll probably do it, but it's a question of is it actually worth doing it for that market? And you're going to see a number of these really high compliance burden type things coming out of different countries, and the challenge for New Zealand is going to be can we, can we afford to or can our companies or do our companies want to continue to service those markets? Uh, and what markets will they be dragged into, or will the, will the supply go to um, when these higher compliance costs are coming in other places? Just think about that. Um, this all takes me to what I like to think of as the training day conundrum. That's a, a reference to a movie starring Denzel Washington. Um, Denzel in that movie is playing a corrupt cop. Um, and he has this great phrase when uh, the hero of the story is about to find him out. And he says, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And this is where, if you just ignore the metaphor, the fact that he's the bad guy, um, he's right, in that, and we find this in trade all the time. We know our food is safe, um, we know it's produced to high environmental standards, but can you prove it? And probably more importantly, does the other side want to have it proved to them uh, as a challenge for us? <clears throat> 
So this isn't new to us, um, as Simon pointed out. Um, we, we've faced this through food safety, biosecurity, and other of those more technical, um, product-specific type things. Um, but I can see that in the next 20, 30 years, this will be an ongoing challenge for us, is, is getting into those relationships and proving to others that we're meeting the standards that they want. And there's just time to move on quickly. So that's some of the risks, right? So you see this fragmentation, cost of trade going up at all times, and it's quite insidious. It's not a tariff. It's not that obvious, but it is just cost that you need to get baked into the supply chain, which is very difficult for business. On the other hand, there are some big opportunities for us in this coming together environment and trade. One, commercially, we actually stack up pretty well. So ignore the, um, don't, well, don't ignore, but um, put aside the debate in New Zealand, which can be quite pejorative about the impact of agriculture and food production on the environment, uh, and see that we actually compare pretty well. So you're getting the big buyers of food, the Nestle's and others, asking companies to prove their carbon footprint, and when they're doing that, New Zealand's stacking up really well. So we, we're hearing that some companies are able to get access to commercial opportunities that previously they couldn't. On the flip side, you can see it going the other way, that if you can't prove it, you'll lose access to your customer, not per se the market in a regulatory sense. The second opportunity for us is in subsidy reform. So we all know how difficult it is in Geneva at the moment, but there is quite a, a, a pleasing um, uptick and awareness of the environmental damage of subsidising food production. If you overproduce, there's no demand for it in the market, you end up with food waste, but you also end up with increased impact on the environment for what you're actually producing. What I think is interesting here is that I don't... Someone asked the question about who's kind of leading, we proactive and reactive. I think what we're likely to see, I hope, and we're going to try and encourage this through different mechanisms, is unilateral reduction in, in subsidies because they're environmentally harmful. And you've actually seen that in the UK when they talk about greening their agricultural programs. We still need to get into the detail of that. But um, public good for public money as opposed to public, public money for just producing stuff and for producing more. Finally, I think there's also um, good opportunity in collaboration. And um, the flip side of this kind of pressure that's on all of us as, as kind of food producing nations is that there's a lot more appetite to work together. And I won't go through all the things we've agreed, but I would highlight um, the sustainable food systems chapter in the, in the European Union FTA that sets up a mechanism for collaboration on these issues, which I think is increasingly going to be really valuable. I would say it's not where the European Union started in that chapter which was much more of here's what you should be doing. Um, and we, we negotiated a slightly different approach. Um, so where do we go now with this? I, I think we're increasingly seeing that we need to be in good, strong primary sector relationships with other countries. If I can be um, slightly self-critical, I think New Zealand has tended to turn up more for negotiations than for relationships. That's something that we're going to have to fix. Um, and I think what, why I'm saying that, we need to really more deeply understand other countries' systems and we need to understand their drivers, both political, um, policy, others. The problem, one of the challenges we have is it's not typically in agricultural primary sector ministries' DNA around the world um, to collaborate. So we've got a certain amount of suspicion that we need to overcome before we get into the conversations. Um, so uh, we're, we're working hard on that. Um, one of the things we're trying to do, if we're working very closely, I know this has a CER flavour, this uh, conversation, is working very closely with Australia on these issues and um, have just come back from APEC in the last couple of days where uh, we're, we're working together through that group on a set of principles that were developed between Australia and us on how we should think about these issues of sustainability and trade that is outcome and evidence focused uh, and that will enhance the multilateral system rather than undercut it with unilateral approaches. So watch the space on that. So um, very quickly we'll just say I think IPEF in this space is going to be really interesting. It's, um, I love the metaphor of the plane. Um, I can think of some other flying objects that you could compare it to. But the thing about it that's interesting is it's hybrid, right? Like it's a hybrid kind of is a trade negotiation in certain parts, but it's also a kind of economic design initiative. And one of the things we're looking to push through IPEF is some commitments to higher performance in agriculture and climate change in particular. Um, and as um, Stu said, all of that comes off the back of what we're doing and trying to do domestically, that we feel more confident to go and do that. So, and, and I've overstayed my welcome, so um, just to summarise real quickly, there's risk and opportunities in this area. We're well placed. We've got some job work to do to prove it all. Um, there's a need for more collaboration and more shared approaches globally. 
And finally, trade agreements are still really important, but they're not the only way. And they're, not, they're not the only way to get there, and they're not the only thing we need to do, need to, do to get the outcomes we need. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. You've packed a lot in there, and I think it's a really timely reminder that for sustainable trade, we need to not just talk about having a rules-based system that gives you access, but what the actual rules are and what do they demand in terms of compliance costs. I'll hand over now to Mark Sinclair from MFAT. Uh, kia ora, koto. Good morning, everyone. Um, good to be here. Uh, especially uh, at this time of all times, talking about our sustainable um, future. I guess the first thing I, I would say is how far we, we've come. Um, my first real exposure to the, the trade and sustainability agenda was a uh, new tradie uh, posted to uh, Geneva from um, 2001 and inheriting a uh, trade and environment portfolio um, was quite focused on the, uh, the agon agonising at that time around um, trade rules uh, undercutting environment uh, agreements. I also inherited the chairmanship of the, um, a, a rather tiny group called the Friends of Fish. We were just starting to um, uh, work on the crusade to tackle um, fishery subsidies, which do, were doing such enormous damage uh, to um, global uh, fisheries. Um, in a different incarnation in later years, I also found myself um, in a different setting, the UNFCCC, but again in rather lonely company making the, the case rather forlornly for eliminating uh, fossil fuel subsidies, which, as you know, are such a huge driver of um, CO2 emissions uh, at a global level. So in some ways it's very satisfying um, to see us in such a different place these, these days. Um, you know, fast forward to last year, uh, our WTO team, including um, Minister O'Connor, were um, at the heart of the action and pulling together the, the, the big um, WTO deal on fisheries subsidies, enormously satisfying to the many Kiwis and others who'd worked on that um, over many years. But there, and also on fossil fuel subsidies, I guess we've got to say in the same breath, there's a, a huge amount of um, unfinished business. It's not for lack of trying on our part. Um, you've heard some of the examples mentioned by other speakers. Um, we've pushed hard to uh, better align our trade agenda with our sustainability agenda, um, particularly over the last five years. Uh, we've been breaking new ground in um, advancing a sustainability agenda in our in negotiations with the Brits and the uh, Europeans. Uh, we're doing the, the separate ACTS team with uh, ACTS negotiation with a bunch of other like-minded small um, countries. There's a story in, in um, each of those areas, but today I want to focus specifically on the um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF, um, partly because it's big and new and moving past, past. Um, but more because it breaks uh, further new ground in what it seeks to achieve, particularly and specifically on climate and how we're going about it. And um, also because uh, part of the fascination of it is, um, I don't know where uh, Deborah found out our secrets, but we're actually designing this thing as we, uh, as we fly it. <laughs> um, there are moments as... Uh, Phil Holding said to me earlier, where it looks more like a balloon than an airplane, but um, <laughs> it's an insider joke. Um, let me start with the what of IPF. It, it, it started as a Biden uh, initiative. It goes back to 2021, when um, some of us were talking to the new team in uh, DC about the importance of the United States um, re-engaging in the regional trade and economic agenda. You'll remember that Mr. Trump took uh, the United States out of um, TPP. Um, we also uh, emphasised the need for rebuilding American credentials on um, response to global warming. Again, you'll remember Mr Trump had taken the United States out of the um, 
Paris Agreement. There was a lot of action uh, in the first half of 2021. What emerged uh, from that, later to become IPEF, was uh, led out of the White House. Um, inevitably, uh, there were geopolitical as well as commercial and sustainability drivers, and um, it took a form that, that had very little resemblance to any traditional um, uh, trade initiative, and, and partly for those reasons. Um, jumping ahead, following a big push from the uh, NSC to uh, develop a, a, a broad base of um, participation, reflecting its regional ambitions. Um, President Biden uh, convened a political launch for IPEF in May uh, 2022. We had um, 14 countries representing 40% of global GDP, and with India in there, 60% of global population. So most of the ASEANs, um, India, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and, um, and Fiji. And then we launched a negotiation uh, at a ministerial meeting in Los Angeles uh, last September after releasing four um, scoping papers on what we were trying to achieve. Now, one of those four so-called pillars, and the one I want to focus on today, focuses on the so-called clean economy. Um, I won't walk through the, the sub, subheadings there, but it's a reasonably broad set of the, pr the practical issues you need to address domestically uh, as well as internationally if you're working to have um, impact in driving transition to um, net zero emissions uh, economies. So now we are at the point of focusing on what um, those various components might look like in the form of text. Perhaps more important even than the scope is the ambition uh, we bring to it. Those who follow uh, American politics and, um, and business will be aware of the scale uh, of resources that have been unlocked, um, first by the passage of the, um, the Biden administration's infrastructure um, act in, uh, in 2021, it is now, and then the Inflation Reduction Act, so-called, which is actually a, a big piece of climate legislation last year. In very round terms, it, it looks as if there's, you know, a trillion dollars, more or less, uh, sloshing around available for, be, for deployment over the next, um, next few years. In anybody's language, that's an enormous amount of money. In spite of the, all the predictable problems in um, dispersing that, we're going to see uh, a deep transformation of the uh, United States economy uh, on the back of that. Team Biden clearly has ambitions to um, leverage that not just for American industrial policy um, and to uh, get the United States on track uh, to their 2050 target of uh, being a net zero economy, but also to extend that campaign um, across the, uh, the region. Uh, where do we sit in that? Let's start with the current realities. Most fundamentally, I think it's understood around this room that we cannot now afford growth unless it is green growth. Um, the, the, the fact is that the planetary boundaries have already been reached and exceeded. Uh, so. Our task now is to uh, work for sustainable development at a global level. Among other things, in our region, that means we need urgently uh, to find incentives for the emerging economies to leapfrog uh, what's a currently an emissions intensive economic model uh, and work for prosperity instead through um, solutions involving renewable resources, nature-based solutions and clean technologies. How are we going about it? Come back to IPF. Uh, trade is a key to us. Um, there are, there's a, a technical reason uh, for that. Clean tech, the new systems that we're talking about involve complex supply chains and insatiable markets in, a, in a, an environment of uh, natural resource scarcity, uh, specialization and trade makes even more sense. I mean, it's original economic logic. Uh, we also need to ensure that what we do in a negotiation like this is grounded in everyone's national net zero commitments under the Paris Agreement. Uh, 
and focused on gearing up to get there faster, at lower cost, and above all, through collaboration. Um, I guess this is partly a philosophical point, it's also a, a practical one. You know, as with the Paris Agreement, which was critical in shaping the political consensus on climate response, central to the approach we're taking in IPEF is a recognition that hard rules don't get you very far in an area like this. It's ultimately uh, more about collaboration than rules if you really want to have um, impact in an area where sensitivities will otherwise tend to um, mean that domestic uh, demands prevail. Um, I noted earlier that New Zealand was firmly committed to the principle that trade and economic instruments should support climate action. Uh, IPEF arguably goes further than we have hitherto. Its point of departure, and this is written into our scoping language, is a net zero climate uh, outcome. As to the how of it, it's um, a bit of a novelty for us. Uh, normally it's the tradies who um, lead in a negotiation. In this case, for the climate pillar in IPEF, we've got a climate expert leading and we're working quite closely with our climate finance experts who are based in our, uh, negotiate, in our um, development, um, development group. Um, I'm pretty much uh, out of time, but um, in closing, let me just say uh, the clean economy text, um, I mean, it is an experiment. We are genuinely designing it as we go. It's um, proving a very inclusive um, approach. There have uh, been quite a few, how can I put this, gaps, S sounds unkind. The um, the, the, the initial text we, we're working from had a, a lot of placeholders. Um, we are enthusiastically um, trying to flesh out um, gaps around some of those placeholders, injecting New Zealand percep perceptions and interests, and we're seeing that from um, others. We are working closely with um, other players uh, to try and accommodate their interests. Uh, we are, above all, looking at elements that will ultimately deliver impact through collaborative processes, uh, capacity building, um, mobilising the private finance, which is going to be at the heart of um, boosting uh, green in investment flows, and um, looking not just at uh, what's in the um, agreed text and the, the black letter commitments there, but above all at a, an open-ended um, collaborative work program, which will be the guts of how we work to actually deliver on we, what we need to deliver. I'm going to close, close there. Thank you for the opportunity to, um, to uh, talk about IPEF. Happy to uh, elaborate on any of that um, in question time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. It will indeed be fascinating to see how the clean tech and climate aspirations that are being developed in IPEF are going to engage with the domestic transformation on the US side, which of course has a strong America first element. Um, let me pass the mic to uh, Glynis Miller from Pacific Trade and Investment. Vinaka and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Glynis, and I lead the team at Pacific Trade Invest uh, out there in Newmarket. Um, before coming into the role, so just a, bit, a little bit about background of who I am and what I do. So before I came into the role as Trade Commissioner, I worked for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat for over 30 years. Uh, the last 10 years of that work was primarily leading the team on private sector development and how working very hard across the regions, private sector, SM, working with SMEs on the ground, um, to influence trade policy and the work that the Secretariat was doing in that space. Uh, when you work for a regional organization, any of them, in fact, FFA, Forum Fish Fisheries Agency, SBC, the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, Forum Secretariat, you, you develop over time a wealth of knowledge and understanding of the region because you work very closely both uh, alongside governments as well as with the private sector, so you're in the public uh, private sector space. One of the 
when I took up the role at Pacific Trade Invest here, it was quite fitting in that I was able to bring that knowledge and understanding uh, of the private sector into what it is that Pacific Trade Invest is set out to do. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. So my delivery this afternoon, um, Madam Facilitator, is, is not necessarily from the Pacific, uh, sorry, from the New Zealand end, but from the, I speak for, for the Pacific and from the Pacific to give you some insights into some of the bodies of work that's in train um, and the efforts that are being made by regional organizations like the Forum and working alongside national governments to achieve their economic aspirations. So as I said, I'm not going to talk about trade liberalization or multilateral trade. I'd rather leave that to the experts on the panel, people who know more about it than I do. But what I am going to talk about today is sustainable trade, that which supports, nay promotes, sustainable development from the broader social socio-economic development for a more resilient Blue Pacific continent. As many of you will be aware, last year in Fiji, leaders of the Pacific Islands Forum endorsed the blueprint for the region, that is the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent. If you want a copy of it, you can go to the Forum's website and download a copy. The Blue Pacific narrative, and, and I must say that in developing this strategy, there was a, a lot of consulta consultation, as you do, but what I found so enriching being part of this work when I worked at the forum was to see the appetite on the part of our policy makers, our government officials, finally realizing that coming together, the narrative changed on this collectiveness and approaching regional dimensions, the bodies of work that drive economic and social development from a regional a togetherness perspective. So the Blue Pacific narrative is the core driver of collective action for advancing our leaders' vision. It provides a foundational basis for Pacific regionalism. And I'm sure many of you have come across that acronym, I'm sorry, that, that phrase, Pacific regionalism. The Blue Pacific makes the call to work together as one blue continent, to harness our shared ocean identity, our geography, our resources, to drive positive change in the region's socio-cultural, political, and economic development. This narrative encourages that we assert our shared ocean geography our res and resources for the security and good of our ocean and for the prosperity of our peoples. Our role as Pacific Trade Invest New Zealand is to faci facilitate exports from the Pacific Island countries to New Zealand and promote Pacific Island investment opportunities to New Zealand investors and to international investors. As an arm of the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, we're obligated to serve all 16 Pacific Island Forum, Pacific Forum members across the three sub-regions, Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia, including the two French territories of French Polynesia and New Caledonia. It is incumbent on us, therefore, as Pacific Trade Invest, to forge relations with governments, to understand where their priorities sit, in which sectors, which in turn informs our own interventions to enhance their national export efforts with New Zealand market. Just recently, as an example, in January this year, we had been talking to an investor in the UK for over 10 months, since about May last year, and introduced their concept of energy efficiency and energy independence to the government of Niue. Uh, long story short, we accompanied the investor to Newway in January, where they signed an MOU with the government. And the intention there is not to compete with donors or development partners who are in the same space, but rather to complement these efforts. So at the end of the day, bringing energy solutions to a country like Newway will inevitably promote or support the peoples of that country. We have the same efforts underway in Marshall Islands up north uh, around the, uh, in renewable energy. We have efforts in Papua New Guinea and Newair again in, in medical. 
So, yes, indeed. I mean, you know, when you talk about sustainable trade, we hear a lot about government's efforts to, and, and COVID did this for us. You know, we had these new phrases come through, agility. We must switch this way and turn that way and be ready to be agile and diversify. But when I talk to governments, what do you really mean about that? It's very hard for them to articulate, but when you talk to the private sector, they can tell you straight away what it means for them. But for us, I mean, for me, it, it will take, and I say this to governments all the time, it will take investment to bring about those changes that you want. When you want to diversify your economy from a nay tourism uh, focus to agriculture or fisheries or renewable energy, it will take investment. So our work and our role at Pacific Trade Invest is we, it's important for us to understand what the government's priorities are so that we're able to bring the right fit of investors or investment um, into the region. So across the Pacific, Blue Pacific, national trade policy frameworks are now incorporated and mainstreamed into national development plans. Within the regional architecture, trade architecture, there are several strategies and trade policies which are in place, and I just name a few, you probably heard of them, the Pacific Aid for Trade Strategy, the Pacific Regional E-Commerce Strategy and Roadmap, Labor Mobility, I think there's one on CARVA, Pacific Quality Infrastructure, and there's so many others. So that, I just mentioned a few just to highlight that the region is indeed spearheading and carving out their own strategies and policies fit for purpose by themselves and for themselves. Within this context, our region is making inroads in achieving some levels of economic recovery after COVID-19 pandemic, with many Pacific economies facing debt stress, amongst other fiscal challenges. Against this backdrop, Pacific Island countries are undergoing regulatory reforms to enable a more fluid and robust business environment. We're seeing more and more government-led initiatives in key sectors of their economy striving for a better connectivity, for example, to ensure a well-connected region. We're seeing real efforts being made to protect our ocean and the environment, and so on and so forth. The investment climate across our region is rich in opportunities, and these are aligned, as I said earlier on, to national priorities set out by governments who recognize the need to diversify their investment portfolios in the social services sectors of health, education, housing, etc. Investments that will help address energy efficiency to benefit households and in the maritime transport sector, for example. Trading relations with Pacific Island countries will find that the Pacific's trade in goods is mainly in the food and beverage sector, fresh and frozen agricultural produce, water, sugar, kava, molasses, honey, vanilla, and the list goes on. Fresh and frozen, uh, frozen fish, clothing, textiles, FMCG goods, coffee, cacao, alcohol. I'm sure a lot of you have consumed a lot of these. Hopefully, you have. These sectors require critical thinking to up their game. These sectors require critical thinking to up their game if they are to continue to be competitive in the New Zealand market. In the services sector, New Zealand's footprint in the Pacific is evidenced in construction and engineering, tourism, health, banking, property, development, and others. Just let me conclude by saying I think it would be true to say that the principles of sustainable trade are indeed at the forefront of those tasked with the enormous responsibility to bring about the winds of change for a safe and secure Blue Pacific continent. I thank you, Madam Facilitator. Thank you, Glynis. It is actually very arresting to me to hear the imagery flipped from green economy to blue Pacific, which of course is central to an ocean-based set of island states. So that was, um, gave us much to think about. Um, our final panelist is Malcolm Johns from Genesis Energy. Uh, kia ora koutou, nga mihi ki te mana whenua. Uh, Kao Malcolm Johns, toko ingoa. Uh, Roringa tārama, tēnā koutou. I'm not quite sure why I'm in this panel, to be honest. <laughs> 
um, because I don't belong to MFAT, I belong to the private sector, uh, and I've had uh, what I would call an accidental career with trade and New Zealand's uh, trade policy. Um, so what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about how I and my family got to now through trade and the lessons that I've learnt. Uh, so in the 1700s, my family was domiciled in Northern Ireland uh, and uh, uh, struggled to survive in that part of the world, so made the uh, big call to head across to southwestern Scotland, uh, where they formed a footprint, uh, but weren't a big enough clan to defend themselves against other clans, so merged with the McCullum clan. Uh, and uh, Julie went about supplying both the English and Scottish sides of their various uh, fracas over the years. Uh, then, after the English triumphed uh, and went through the clearances, uh, they sought a better life in Manchester, working in the mills, exporting fine linen to uh, the rest of the world. Uh, and as they worked out that that didn't quite deliver what they were looking for, in 1903 they decided to sail to New Zealand uh, where they purchased a dairy farm and spent several decades dairy farming, uh, producing goods uh, and products and services to sell back to the United Kingdom, heavily subsidised by the New Zealand government who in 1984, of course, went bankrupt and were unable to maintain the subsidies. Uh, and so today, uh, my family is not involved in dairy farming, and the valley that I lived in that had 10 family dairy farms in it now has one corporate dairy farm in it, farming several thousand head of cattle. Uh, so it wasn't for me to continue into uh, a career of food production. Uh, I got kicked out into university and ultimately ended up in the logistics uh, aspect of New Zealand's trade, principally in aviation, uh, where I've spent several, uh, several decades building New Zealand's international aviation architecture, which is absolutely essential to our standard of living. Uh, aviation uh, exports about 1% of our trade by volume at the moment, uh, but uh, that accounts for 18% of our trade by value, so it's incredibly high value. Coming the other way is all the specialist components that keep our transport system working, uh, keep our heart operations happening and our hip and knee replacements occurring uh, right across New Zealand. So in, uh, in 2017, I think it was, uh, Minister uh, O'Connor invited me to serve on his Trade for All working group, which came as a shock to me, because up until that point I had no conscious knowledge that I was part of New Zealand's trading architecture. So I duly joined that group in Wellington, a group of just a small group of I think about 38 or 39 of us, uh, making sure that every aspect of New Zealand society was completely covered. Uh, I was the only person in a grey suit, uh, so I must have been the grey suit component uh, of that diversity. But it was very much a group inside New Zealand looking out to the rest of the world from a trade perspective. Uh, and the very name of that group, uh, Trade for All, was illuminating to me. Uh, because, like so many people in New Zealand, uh, I was unconsciously benefiting from the trade architecture and the trade systems that New Zealand has. But I wasn't aware that anybody in New Zealand really saw trade through a negative lens. And so it was an absolutely awesome experience to be part of that working group, looking at New Zealand's trade policy from the perspective of how does it benefit all, uh, all of us. And it was off the back of that uh, that in 2019 the Prime Minister invited me to be one of New Zealand's three delegates on the APEC Business Council. And that's a body that flips you outside of New Zealand to look back inward at uh, regional trade architecture. Uh, and being someone whose personal mission in life is to be a good ancestor, uh, both personally and in my professional career, I naturally levitated towards the sustainable working group of the APEC Business Council, uh, where I was duly put in charge of the climate change uh, work programme. And for the last three and a bit years, that's largely been the focus of my effort, is to understand climate change in the context of uh, regional trade policy. And there are a few things that have been really interesting during my APEC Business Council journey. The first of all is you sit down 
with 20 other economies. There are 21 economies in the APEC region. And of course, uh, you know, you make your first presentation uh, on climate change and the importance of climate change uh, to the world. And what you find instantly is in New Zealand, we have a really clearly defined perspective on what sustainability and climate change looks like. But it's not shared widely in the world. I count of those 21 economies in terms of the philosophy that we advance in terms of sustainability, about four partners, four other economies in the region look at climate change and sustainability through the similar lens to us. The rest don't. Some of them look at it purely from a, a potable water perspective. Many look at it through an indigenous, indigenous economic uh, perspective. Some look at it through a purely commercial perspective. Others look at it through an injustice and standard of living perspective. You in the West, you developed countries, you've raised your standard of living and caused this, and now you want us to share in the consequences of dealing with it, and we're not going to. And so that's the first thing that you encounter, is that you're largely in charge of herding a set of cats towards uh, some sort of recommendation to leaders in terms of how climate change should be brought into regional trade policy. But that's, that, of course, is part of stepping out of New Zealand and, and looking back. And the journey over the last three years has taught me that trade policy really sits in the hopes and dreams of a tribe or a population of people. When that interfaces with the rest of the world, uh, you use free trading agreements to crystallise what uh, the reality of those hopes and dreams might look like. And then it's left to people like me in industry to form the logistics, the production uh, and the uh, exporting functions that bring trade to life. And so, uh, as I concluded my APEC Business Council journey uh, just last week uh, with the meeting here in Auckland, uh, I, made, I made the observation uh, to my colleagues that there are uh, three simple uh, lessons for me as, as you approach uh, international trade policy and in particular sustainability in it. The first and most important is you must sweep your own backyard first. Now, when I joined the APEC Business Council, New Zealand didn't subsidise fossil fuels. We do today. We have an enduring tax credit on petrol and diesel that is seen by the rest of the world as a subsidy of fossil fuels. We have a highly protected airline in Air New Zealand. When COVID came along and the borders shut and we needed the aviation sector to step up and continue to export and import those essential goods, our government spent well over a billion dollars keeping planes flying and Air New Zealand got the lion's share of that. In 2019, of the 11 international routes flown by Air New Zealand, only one had true competition on it. The other 10 had immunised competition by virtue of government-to-government -government agreements. So the outside world saw us as protecting our international airline when we see ourselves as an open and free trading country. So the most important thing is that we sweep our own, our own backyard first. Don't tell other people how to view climate change and sustainability if we haven't walked the talk here in New Zealand. The second lesson is when I joined the APEC Business Council, the decay of the, the rules-based system in the WTO was the number one issue. And when I left last week, geopolitical tensions was the number one issue. Geopolitical tensions are infecting international trade architecture in a way that we haven't seen since before World War II. The third thing, and the most important thing to me, is those geopolitical tensions are at high risk of using climate change as a weaponised tool for trade protection. And if we allow that to happen in our region or globally, Climate change will be the loser, we will suffer climate change, and we'll sacrifice our efforts in that area uh, to maintain uh, geopolitical trade barriers and trading blocks. So the three things I leave you with, sweep your own backyard first, understand that geopolitical tensions are now the largest shaping force in our trade architecture, 
and don't, under any circumstances, allow our trading architecture or agreements to weaponise climate change for trade protection. Lord Ida, tēnā koutou. Thank you very much, Malcolm. That was a, a, a wonderful snip of your personal journey and the lessons are, are, well, are well put. Um, it, I was reminded of words from someone you may have a distant ancestral tie to, if only we could see ourselves as others see us. Um, I would now like to open the floor for discussion. Um, if I can't see you, at least attract the person with the mic, but I do see you over there. In the... oh, sorry. Um, kia ora. Um, so my question is more to Glennis. Um, thank you for your presentation. I like the way that the, the, the plan by the um, Perth Secretary is sort of based around, I guess, our sea of islands, and that was really nice to hear. Um, my question, um, in investing in the socioeconomic and, I guess, cultural fibre of the Blue Pacific, um, how do you sort of reconcile the imperatives of economic prosperity and trade and investment and the priorities of culture and social well-being and climate change? And I'm thinking for the likes of the examples of um, recently, you know, the Cook Islands went from developing to developed, but during that period we had the impacts of COVID. And so there was a question of where do they get their sort of economic support from when they're not no longer a developing nation, but their main supply of um, I guess supporting their economy, tourism was cut off and then they had to consider the likes of cobalt reserves in terms of creating renewable energy or renewable batteries. Um, and I guess in that sense, how, what do you see the roles of Australia and New Zealand, uh, New Zealand to better support a blue Pacific continent? It's a very long-winded question. But could you just kind of, uh, there's a lot in there, sorry. <laughs> Basically, how do you balance out the imperatives of trade and investment um, and trying to get economic prosperity whilst also trying to be cultural, like uh, support yeah. cultural and social well-being yeah. um, in terms of climate change? Yeah, I, I did make, uh, that's a very good question, thank you. I did make the reference to uh, the cultural nuances of how Pacific do business and how that's very different to the European standards, if I can use that ter terminology. In the, in the context of trade and investment and how that all came together during COVID, involving or, or, or uh, recognising the value that culture brings to that, um, to that game, it was really, really important to um, in, involve the private sector, but also the, the communities where a lot of the communities lost their uh, source of income through tourism, etc. So the, the government's efforts in that regard, uh, and this is how we were able, we along with other NGOs, were able to influence, I think we had a lot of discussions with governments around that time to influence governments thinking and uh, around the support that was required uh, towards, driven towards the community so that a lot of them then went back to their cultural and traditional practices and turned that into an income generation during the COVID pandemic. When we talk to governments and NGOs and CSOs, uh, SOE um, CEOs about the investment, um, their investment priorities, it's important for us to involve the community in all of those discussions. And we make concerted efforts to do that. When we were in Newe uh, in January this year, that was the start of a 24-month project, an investment project that will cover 24 months uh, in phase one. Um, what we learned from, if I can use Newe as an example, what we learned from uh, our consultations with the communities in Newe was that um, their, their cultural practices for collecting water, simple things like that, for collecting water in times of drought and, and recognizing the different change in weather patterns to, uh, influence their decisions and influence their thinking. But at the same time, the government, so New Way is a small enough country where everyone's related to each other or knows everybody, right? So that communication line between communities and governments was quite uh, fluid. But in other bigger countries like 
perhaps, you know, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, if I can be so bold as to name a few, that line of communication isn't there. I think at the end of the day, my, what I'm trying to say is the balance when we're trying to influence trade, trade policy, investment policies, it's important for us to listen to the people on the ground. Because for a lot of them, their, particularly in the communities, their cultural practices is still alive today, and that is what drives a lot of their endeavors. And it's important for those of us in the trade policy space to listen to them. Thank you. Um, kia ora. I'm Chelsea Roberts from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I guess my question is, we see a lot of the same countries that have agreed to certain efforts in climate change negotiations, I guess renegotiating or even ignoring some of those commitments when it comes to the trade space. For example, we're still talking about fossil fuel subsidy reform with countries who explicitly agreed to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Um, so I guess my question is, how can we ensure that we're using trade agreements and how can we talk about trade in a way that holds people accountable and noting Malcolm's, column, uh, Malcolm's comments keeps us accountable as well? Um, no easy answer. Um, I mean, I, as I said earlier, having, having been involved on the fossil fuel subsidy cause um, over many years, I'm struck at the end of it by, um, you know, what a lonely process uh, it, 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 it can be. Uh, I also mentioned the example of, um, of fishery subsidies, which was an equally lonely crusade, I can tell you. Um, back in the day, um, I think one of the assets um, you know, one of the strengths that we bring to a number of the, the critical issues like this is um, uh, a con combination of um, orneriness and strategic patience. So it took us, what, but over 20 years, I guess, to get to that um, WTO deal on fishery subsidies last year. It is testament, ultimately, to the power of a combination of good ideas and um, uh, patience and coalition building. Um, uh, you know, we've touched on the the, the, the range of um, Pacific Pacifica interests that are in play as well. I mean, there certainly in a climate context, and I think uh, at times in a trade context as well, um, there is a capacity that our Pacific cousins uh, have to harness uh, moral outrage to actually help shape um, outcomes. We saw it on the, in the debate around um, uh, the global target, temperature target in UNFCCC process, getting 1.5 in there, not just uh, two degrees. Um, uh, bottom line, you know, we mustn't give up and we should back ourselves in good company to achieve results that uh, along the way may at times look um, improbable or, uh, or out of reach. Oh, there we go. Kia ora tato. Um, my name is Tiana Carter. I'm in the Climate Change Division at MFAT as well. Um, I'm really interested in, um, I suppose, we've talked a lot about collaboration and um, the issues that are facing regarding sort of weaponising trade and that. So my question is about sort of the multilateral system and um, the future of sort of multilateral climate change negotiations um, and whether these there are there is still value, there's opportunities in processes such as the UNFCCC and the COP and that, um, recognising that it is sort of moving away from negotiations to perhaps implementation of the Paris Agreement and the goals that are in there, um, and the increasing sort of trade presence and business presence and civil society presence at COP as well each year, and how can sort of New Zealand maybe um, uh, take, uh, sort of work with those opportunities and... and um, yeah, whether there are opportunities there. Thank you. 
Um, it's a great question, and I, it led me it's probably slightly in response to the previous question as well. Um, I guess I have a view that uh, I can only speak in the sort of food production space, but just to, the context is that the food system globally is about, depending on kind of how you measure it, 24 to 37% of emissions, right? So I'd, uh, others may want to talk about other sort of sectors. But most governments will say we're not going to, well, food production will be the last thing we touch in terms of climate mitigation um, because food security, and, you know, and Malcolm made the point really well, is a much bigger issue for people. So I was in India last year and uh, you know, speaking to a former Secretary of Agriculture and he said we are much more worried about the impact of climate on food production than the impact of food production on climate. So why would a country, you know, conceptually like India or, or any other country that's for, for which food security is a big problem jump into a mitigation discussion? Um, and the good news is that there are lots of really good collaborative things you can do um, that don't require any negotiation, right? And I think this is something I'd, I'd come to. I mean, I don't think it's about other countries holding each other to account per se in the space. I think it, or negotiating, you need to take a bigger cut. And there's always an element of that. But it's actually what can we do? And in our space, that's really key. And so we have the Global Research Alliance that um, has been run out of MPI for just over a decade now. Uh, and it's all about how do you achieve those Cut off, oh, back. Um, how do you achieve the double objective of higher food production and at a lower emissions intensity, right? So um, where does that multilateral space go? On the one hand, it's going to be, I, I think, and I refer to the principles that the Australians and we have developed and we're trying to push out into the region, it's yes, we're committing to reduce our environmental footprint of food production, we're committing to work together, but we're also committing not to punish each other um, if we're going at a different pace where our system um, is not going to get there. So I think the more you end up in a kind of negotiation, confrontation space, um, the more you're likely to push countries into a corner and just not engage. At least where I'm sitting, that's where that's coming through in the food space. So if we can enter into less of a kind of negotiation and more of a let's talk about what we can achieve together and, and climate will go further faster, I think. Uh, my, my comment on that would be that there's a propensity at these uh, events to try and eat the whole issue rather than eat the component parts of the issue. So there's a practical reality here. No country is going to knowingly allow their people to starve, uh, so they're going to prioritise food production. Um, uh, energy poverty will probably come uh, close after that. But the two areas that, uh, if you break it down from how do we deal with climate change, um, every, every economy in the world has to transition assets from you, assets that use non-renewable energy to assets that use renewable energy. So if you've got a petrol car, you can't put electricity in it, so you're going to have to buy an electric car or a hydrogen car, etc. There's about $3.5 trillion of investment globally a year that needs to occur in that asset transition to begin enabling an energy transition to occur. We're not spending anywhere near that. The US has just set aside a trillion dollars, biggest budget in the world, but it's still only a third of what's needed annually for the next 20 years to deal with uh, the energy transition or trigger the energy transition. So if you could break it down to plurilateral agreement on, on transport and energy, transport in terms of asset transition, energy in terms of energy transition to support that uh, asset transition, then you open up the opportunity for uh, much more impactful agreements and commitments to be made. And key in that is the movement of technology, raw materials, uh, products, et cetera, uh, and ultimately uh, um, services and, and, um, uh, and IP around renewable energy. So to me, my comment would be, I just listened to some of the approaches to this and, and, and trying to eat the whole issue at once. Um, there are large aspects of climate change that countries won't go near for another 10 to 15 years because of the practical reality of social uh, cohesion and standard of living. And so chew on those bits uh, where you're, you're much more likely to get transition. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, from, I, I agree with the earlier speakers, but from a of the Pacific countries' perspective, 
as we all know, climate change for them is real. So the displacement of their peoples is at the forefront of a lot of thinking and planning on the part of governments. They lose their cultural identity. There's a lot of legal thinking going around to people displacement because of climate change. So I look at climate change opportunities, to use your words, more from the implementation side, where, where Pacific Island countries are carving out their solutions to climate change. And I think we shouldn't lose uh, face of the fact that um, the region, indeed, in New, in New Zealand included, but the Pacific is leading the charge on this because for them it's very real. You know, wharves breaking down, sea walls breaking every time there's a flood, housing inundated with water. We've seen evidence of that down the East Coast. But more so from the Pacific, and people displacement is so real. You can talk to any Pacific Island country, you can talk to any community across the region, and they will tell you how very real that is for them because they lose their culture, there's, there's risk of losing their cultural identity because of that displacement. Okay, uh, a couple of questions, one here, and then Stephanie. Um, this, oh, oh, what was it? Glynis, mm. um, <laughs> this one's for you. Um, I was just wondering if you could um, kind of indicate, do you think that within the PIF Secretariat and PIF member countries are sufficiently orientated towards or oriented towards sustainable trade. So like looking at the 2050 strategy, um, sustainable trade doesn't really form like a main pillar and the same main as like say climate change or um, there is a, a section about economic development but it doesn't explicitly mm. refer to, to trade. Do you think in your opinion um, is that is the focus on trade kind of where it should be, or should it be more? Mm. I don't know, just interested in your thoughts. Yeah, so, so trade is an enabler, or one of the seven pillars, um, or economic development rather, to achieve economic development, one of the seven pillars of the Blue Pacific strategy. The, as we speak, there is, um, there is work underway, uh, led by the Forum Secretary, but involving member countries and crop agencies, including Australia and New Zealand, to start designing an implementation plan for that strategy. And they reckon it's gonna take 18 to 24 months before they even start to look at any draft um, versions of an implementation plan. So it's, it will involve a lot of, uh, obviously, consultation from top down, um, including with you know, communities, NGOs, all the way up to governments and across the board to shape that implementation plan to realize to, to, to bring to bear, I guess, the intentions of the 2050 strategy for the next few years to 2050. So in answer to your question, is trade reflected enough in the, in, I think that it's too early to, to argue yes or no. Hopefully that will come through in the design of the impl implementation plan uh, of the strategy. I hope that answers your question. Thank yep. You. Thank you, I've got one. Um, thanks so much to all of the panel. This has been a fascinating session, but especially um, Malcolm, fantastic presentation. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the incredible thought leadership that you showed in ABAC on this climate work. I mean, you really did, did well by New Zealand and by the region um, and the planet there. But um, you've given us a terrible problem that you've identified, this risk of the weaponisation of climate measures for trade protectionism. Now, obviously, we have brilliant people like Mark Sinclair and Phil Holding and Vangelis and all these uh, energetic young, young folks in the room who will be working on that. But what do you see as sort of, you know, what's the first bite of the elephant that we do on that one? Thanks. Well, um from what the, I've heard today, I hear, I hear the word net used, net, net, this, net, that, etc. Um, the difference between gross and net is where climate change will be weaponised for trade protection. And so as we form up global standards and regional standards, uh, the, the, the best measure is always going to be the gross footprint. But uh, my hunch is that the agreements will ultimately talk to a net footprint. Uh, and I can't remember, I think it was uh, your presentation, you talked about data. Um, New Zealand now has a satellite above us that measures the gas compound of our atmosphere by province. Great from a New Zealand domestic policy perspective, but terrifying 
from a, 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 a trade policy perspective if we're on a net basis. So what does net mean? Understanding the difference between gross and net at a, at a, um, at a plurilateral level is going to be the difference between climate change being a friend of trade or weaponised in trade. And so that would be my first, my first point, is that's the bit that scares the living daylights out of me, uh, because most of us think of net as being, well, offset, you know. Um, but is that a short-term offset or a long-term offset? So you're releasing long t uh, uh, CO2 that was stored for long periods of time back into the atmosphere, uh, and then you're going to offset it for a short period of time. So you've got a long release and a short offset that gives you a net position, and if that comes into trade, then you're going to start getting things like the carbon border adjustment mechanisms in the EU that use solar farms in Tanzania funded through foreign aid budgets um, to offset emissions in Hungary uh, for product, products produced using coal and, uh, and diesel-fired electricity. Uh, and that's going to be put up against products from New Zealand that use renewable electricity or sustainable practices, etc. So my number one comment would be the difference between friend and foe is gross and net and understanding how that's going to be defined in, in trade architecture. Yeah, just to come to Steph's question about what's the first thing to do, and it really is on that space, it's, it's agreeing how we're going to measure these things, right? Um, and so, and yeah, all the, the downstream consequences of having different mechanisms of measuring carbon footprint is really going to be really significant, both in terms of being able to take action on climate in the agriculture space and trade. So, um, if you think about New Zealand, you know, we have a very sophisticated inventory of our climate, of our emissions, as Malcolm's alluding to, one of the tools we use for that. But we're trying to go even further, and if you look at the basis of um, the agricultural emissions pricing in terms of Heiwaka Kenoa and that big process that's gone through, it's about measuring down to the farm level how much methane and as accurately as possible. The US is just, um, you know, in, in typically US fashion, you know, $3 billion in climate smart commodity, agriculture commodities, a big part of that is the participants have to be able to measure the impact of what they're doing. So this question of measurement is really important, the question of where you start from is really important, and I think it's probably while we're still in the space of, you know, really just the beginning, I think, of global attention on food production and mitigation, now's the time to get in to the area of agreeing how we're going to measure this stuff, I think. And so the measurement is the place that we're trying to start on that. Thank you. We could squeeze in one brief question. Yep. Kia ora koutou. Um, I work in agricultural trade policy, so this is very relevant. Um, Malcolm, you mentioned that the risk that there's a risk of using climate policy as a means to an end for trade protectionism, and Phil, you mentioned um, the EU Green Deal's implementation is probably the most relevant example of this. Um, New Zealand doesn't really have protectionist interests um, as it relates to climate, or generally, um, and generally just only reacts to the policies of our trading partners. And so my question is, what could New Zealand do to mitigate the risk of uh, trade protectionism through climate policy. Cheers. I, I think the foundation stone is whether we can maintain an independent foreign policy. If we can maintain a genuine independent foreign policy, then the geopolitical influence in, uh, in uh, um, carbon across border uh, um, mechanisms uh, stand better for us than if geopolitics forces us into one block or another. Uh, and if you're in one block, then you can expect the other block uh, to potentially use climate change, carbon border mechanisms uh, as, a, as a trade protection uh, uh, tool. And uh, so to me, it's can New Zealand maintain an independent foreign policy? Uh, because that ultimately determines your geopolitical risk. Uh, and your geopolitical risk, I think, then feeds into your uh, weaponised climate change risk from a trade perspective. Thank you. Um, we are out of time. I must say this panel has covered a lot of ground, and I'm deeply appreciative of, to all the members who have taken us from often the lofty and aspirational words around sustainability 
to what it really means on the ground um, when different parties are facing very urgent but different priorities. And therefore, it is incumbent on all of us, but including our trade negotiators and our regulatory negotiators, to approach this from a perspective that recognizes that countries will keep the lights on, they will keep their populations fed, and they will, you are not going to budge, make them budge uh, just by trying to negotiate harder. And the thing that really rings in my ears, though, is that we need to sweep our own backyard. And I say this being aware that New Zealand imported, I believe, two million tonnes of coal last year. So there's a challenge for all of us, but perhaps particularly for some of us. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank all of my panel, all of the panelists. You were terrific. Thank you.